Welcome to the Modern War Institute speaker series. As most of you are familiar, the Modern War Institute uh, is in DSS. We have a lot of DSS majors here by choice, of course, uh, and, and also on trip section. Um, but we have uh, you know, a series of uh, uh, speakers and panels that really try to push on the tensions of, of um, not only topical, but uh, intellectually substantive arguments and debates that are going on in, in modern society and really to deal with modern war. Um, so it's really a pleasure to have you here, and I'm excited to share with you um, a, a very, uh, just a very smart, engaging, and dynamic uh, friend of mine, I'm happy to call, I, I think. And uh, yeah. uh, ironically enough, he, he and my mother were, and my little brother met on a rafting trip uh, <laughs> last year, ironically enough. Uh, and so they, they became friends, and uh, my mom's like, hey, I met this great guy, and I gave him your contact information, he works at ACLU, and I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Please don't put me in contact with the ACLU. <laughs> um, but it ended up being a, a, an awesome opportunity. We, we had him uh, you know, Google and Skype chat in last semester of the class, and then, of course, followed up with an invitation for this year. Um, so um, and I've come to, to really admire Ben, not only for his hospitality um, and his intellect, but, but really his candor and speaking about what are otherwise very difficult and challenging issues, um, namely today the one between uh, secrecy, privacy, and security, and how we as military professionals deal with that how we think about and communicate with our soldiers about the secrets that we give them <laughs> and, and, and the trust relationship we have with the American people. So Ben is from the ACLU um, and, and is the director of their, uh, I always mess this up, the Technology, Privacy and Speech, speech uh, Project in a different order but close. Uh, but he, he is a director there, has worked um, on these issues for 15 years and most notably, which would, what probably brought you here, is his work with Edward Snowden. Um, so please, you know, join me in a very warm welcome for, for, for Ben as he speaks to us today. Thanks. Caleb, thanks so much for that incredibly warm <coughs> introduction and uh, for your friendship to me also and for your hospitality today. Uh, I enjoyed my first experience in the mess hall here. Uh, I hope it isn't the last. Uh, and thanks especially to all of you for being here. Uh, unlike Donald Trump, who never stops boasting about how many people follow him on Twitter and Facebook, uh, I don't make the mistake of thinking that your presence here equals support. There is something called rubbernecking. Uh, we actually uh, uh, don't even agree on much at all within our office. The ACLU is more of an, as much of an argument as it is an institution. Uh, we have a saying that if you agree with us 80% of the time, you should be a member. And if you agree with us 50% of the time, you should be a board member. So in that spirit, I offer today's polemic. Uh, some of you may actually share some of my points of view, whether you admit it or not. Many definitely won't. Uh, and some of you may even consider these remarks more of a provocation than a legal or political argument. Uh, but I appreciate the chance for us to exchange views uh, in this kind of environment without the rancor of a cable news debate. Uh, and I especially look forward to the part of this hour, and I hope it's at least half, uh, when we can exchange views through some Q&A. So I'm going to divide this into a few parts. First, I'm going to make some general remarks about the very hard problem of democratic oversight of secret government activities. Um, then a little bit about the law and the legal regime that punishes or sanctions unauthorized leaks to the press. Uh, and then some more specific remarks uh, about the surveillance regime that Edward Snowden helped to bring to light with the help of journalists uh, and why I think that those disclosures were important. <clears throat> but I'm actually going to start uh, more than 40 years ago. Uh, in 1971, the year that I was born, uh, a bunch of anti-war activists outside of Philadelphia who called themselves the Citizens Commission to Investigate the FBI broke into an FBI field office. Uh, they packed all of the files from file cabinets into suitcases and stole them all. Uh, they drove home and then uh, you know, read through them, mailed key documents to reporters at the Washington Post. Uh, and the publication of this information for the first time <clears throat> in an American newspaper uh, began to unravel uh, what had been, what is now considered to be uh, uh, a widely abusive and illegal domestic surveillance regime under the leadership of FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, uh, who held that position from the age of 29 
uh, for the next 50 years. Uh, revealed that the FBI um, uh, uh, was trying to spread the feeling among activists that there was an agent behind every bush, had been sending poison pen marriages to, uh, letters to break up the marriages of activists, had infiltrated uh, any student group that was seen to dissent from J. Edgar's view of what uh, America ought to be. Um, I, I start with that because there is an irony um, in this, uh, an irony that you may recognize. Um, uh, those initial disclosures led to uh, a massive bipartisan investigation in Congress called the Church Committee uh, and a new legal regime governing surveillance, uh, domestic surveillance in the United States. The irony, of course, is that it took this dramatic act of lawbreaking uh, in order to reinvigorate democratic oversight, bring congressional attention to something that uh, had largely been happening beneath the surface, uh, and reform the laws in a way that most people thought um, was appropriate. Um, but between those moments of dramatic lawbreaking that, that introduce a, uh, the kind of conversation that I think we're having now um, since the Snowden revelations, uh, we have the ongoing problem uh, of how you manage uh, legitimate government secrecy uh, and the public's right and need to know. And if you believe, as I do, and as I suspect as all of you do, that there are some legitimate government secrets, then that secrecy necessarily presents a conflict between core values. Self-government on the one hand, and self-defense on the other hand. If we don't know what our government is doing, we can't consent to its actions, and we can't hold it accountable for abuses. If we do know what our government is doing, the whole world knows too. Um, so any of these conversations are going to involve this clash of core values. Uh, and any answer to this problem that fails to take both of these values seriously uh, and address them both explicitly uh, hasn't even engaged the problem that I'm talking about today. Uh, and there are dangers on both sides of this balance. Uh, President Kennedy, more than half a century ago, said this, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there's little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there's little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there's a very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it is in my control. It's obvious to anyone here who has studied history that President Kennedy's record didn't quite live up to that rhetoric. Uh, but I think the sentiment is admirably expressed. And it reminds us that not every danger to the republic comes from too much disclosure to the public. Uh, some comes from too little. Uh, and since that time, the problem of overclassification and abuse of classification uh, has gotten much, much worse. Uh, now, in testimony before Congress in August of 2004, the Pentagon's chief information security officer stated that, in his view, at least half of all classified information had no business being classified. Anyone here who has dealt with classified information knows that that is an absurdly modest estimate. So how are we supposed to navigate this clash of core values, uh, self-government uh, and self-defense? Um, who should decide what will be public and what has to remain secret? Uh, I intend to argue today that the answer cannot be that the government should decide on its own. And the reason for that, I think, ought to be clear. If the application of a classification stamp were the beginning and the end of this discussion, then the executive branch would have sole control over the information by which we, the people, judge its actions and, where appropriate, hold it accountable. So if not the executive branch alone, then who? Uh, traditionally, we have looked to the other branches of government. Let's start with Congress, which shares, of course, national defense authority under the Constitution with the president. Uh, in practice, I believe, Congress has more often been an enabler, enabler than a genuine overseer over secret government programs. Um, as I said, following the last major domestic surveillance scandal in this country, 
there were legal reforms. Congress established the House and Senate Select Committees on Intelligence. Uh, the members of those committees uh, have special access to the activities of the intelligence community. And they're supposed to, in our republic, stand in for the rest of us in ensuring that the executive branch complies with the law. Now, of course, the challenge with this model is that in practice, the members of Congress, even on those committees, know only the secrets that the president and his advisors choose to tell them. Uh, we know, for example, that the CIA withheld numerous critical documents from the Senate Intelligence Committee in connection with their investigation of the CIA's use of so-called enhanced interrogation techniques. Uh, indeed, the CIA suspected, uh, when it suspected that the committee had obtained an internal CIA document that contradicted the CIA's public defense uh, of its interrogation techniques, it went so far as to hack the computers of the Senate investigators to find out what they knew. Uh, so the first problem is, how do we make sure that the members of Congress have the information they need in order to stand in for the rest of us? But there's a second problem. And the second problem is that even when those members of Congress do know something, uh, they are often helpless to do much about it, and certainly helpless to call it to public attention. Uh, two examples, uh, both, of whom, both of which involve a senator whom I actually admire, um, Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon, uh, who's been uh, a very able and aggressive member of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, you probably have seen footage of Senator Wyden questioning the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, about the NSA in March of 2013. Uh, and his question for Mr. Clapper was, is there any kind of information that the NSA collects on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? And Clapper's answer was, no, sir. And Senator Wyden was astounded and said, none? Uh, and the answer was, no, sir, not wittingly. Now, that answer wasn't true. Uh, I think that most often it's been portrayed as uh, Mr. Clapper lying to Congress, but I would say that's not what happened at all. Uh, you're not lying to people who know that you're not telling the truth. The members of the Congressional Committee knew exactly uh, what kind of information the NSA was collecting on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans. The people who didn't know were the rest of us. Uh, Senator Wyden and the committee did not ever correct that testimony. Uh, and so I would suggest that this represented a pretty serious failure of congressional oversight, uh, that, the, that the public was not read in. Another example involving the same program. A few years earlier, Senator Wyden stood on the floor of the Senate and said that if the American people knew what he knew about how the Patriot Act was being interpreted to facilitate domestic surveillance, they would be, in his words, stunned and angry. This turned out to be true. But it wasn't Senator Wyden or Congress who informed the American people about that program. It was Edward Snowden and The Guardian newspaper who did so in June of 2013. Now, I concede that there are times when Congress engages in energetic oversight of national security programs. And I suspect that we're in one of those periods right now. But they are nearly always initiated by unauthorized leaks to the press and by journalism. They're not an alternative to those. So what about the federal courts? Right? Aren't the federal courts supposed to pro provide another check against executive power in this realm? Uh, having spent about a decade trying to litigate national security cases in federal courts, here I can speak with some personal experience as well as expertise. Um, I tell a joke that is probably only funny to lawyers, uh, but it is that um, it's going to say on my tombstone, um, he died without reaching the merits. Uh, and what I mean by that is that virtually every time you try to bring a challenge in a federal court to a national security program, whether it has to do with um, uh, the CIA running secret prisons to interrogate uh, people who they kidnap from the streets, whether it involves uh, detention, whether it involves uh, terrorism watch lists, whether it involves drone strikes and an attempt to impose some legal limits there, um, the answer is always the same from the courts. Uh, not to say that the program is legal, not to say that the program is illegal, but to say you have no business being in court. This is not an issue for the courts. This is either a state secret, the people you're suing have some kind of immunity, you have no standing or your plaintiffs have no standing. Uh, a, a, a good example of that, uh, a few months before anybody ever heard the name Edward Snowden, my colleagues at the ACLU tried to bring a constitutional challenge to one of the NSA programs that we were aware of uh, on behalf of journalists, human rights workers, criminal defense lawyers. Uh, and in a five to four decision by the U.S. Supreme Court in March of 2013, we were told this case is dismissed 
uh, it's dismissed because you can't show that your plaintiffs were uh, affected by these programs, and you'll never be able to show that they were affected because that's a state secret. And as a result, neither your plaintiffs nor any others can ever come to court and get us to answer this question, is what the government is doing even legal? Uh, and so th the, the courts, like the Congress, um, uh, while there are times that they are effective, uh, and uh, in 2015, uh, a federal court did strike down one of the NSA programs, but it did so only because Edward Snowden and the newspapers had given us the evidence that we needed in order to show that we were affected by these programs. We could not have done that um, without the press and without a leak. Uh, and so one way to think about these leaks uh, is that they are a kind of democratic immune system response to the problem of executive branch overclassification. You can think of them as a safety valve for our democracy. Uh, a professor at Columbia Law School named David Posen has written a very interesting article about this uh, in which he defends certain leaks as a feature and not a bug uh, of our democratic system. Uh, and think about it. Now, studies have shown that nearly half of current and former senior federal government officials have self-reported that they have leaked information to the press. That surely understates the actual number, which is probably almost all. Uh, with the exception of uh, the vice president's counsel, uh, who allegedly revealed the identity of an undercover agent, none of these officials has ever been prosecuted. Uh, now again, most leaks are not what I would call, or anyone would call, whistleblowing. Uh, most of them serve multiple agendas, including bureaucratic and political agendas in Washington. Here's an example. In September of 2009, Bob Woodward, who is really the dean of the Washington Press Corps, uh, uh, obtained a leaked copy of a confidential military assessment of the war in Afghanistan that included General Stanley McChrystal's opinion that more troops were necessary to avoid mission failure. Now, the purpose of this leak was obviously to manipulate the policy debate and to put public pressure on President Obama to comply with the commanding general's preferred strategy. So amid the mountains of really harmless and illegitimately classified documents that the government produces each year, this leak, the one I'm talking about now, involved one of the small categories of documents that we would all agree is appropriately kept secret. It was a war planning document. Yet the Pentagon showed little interest in discovering who was responsible for leaking these war plans. Uh, and it's easy to understand why that's the case. Uh, we can suspect where the leak came from. But my focus today is not on those kinds of sanctioned government leaks uh, to push public policy, uh, but on a different and more controversial, I think, species of leaks, uh, and that is unauthorized disclosures of conduct and information that the government has aggressively attempted to keep secret. Uh, and let me talk about that species of leaks. In the last decade alone, without unauthorized leaks to the press, uh, we would not have known that the case for war in Iraq in 2002 and 2003 was based on, at a minimum, deliberate exaggerations of the available evidence. Uh, most people who I know would use stronger words. Uh, we would not have known that American soldiers tortured and sexually humiliated prisoners in Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq we would not have known that the CIA set up a network of secret prisons around the world and used a so-called extraordinary rendition program to kidnap people off the streets, chain them to the floors of planes, and fly them to those places. We would not have known about an enhanced interrogation program known to the rest of the world and to us for most of our history as torture, where prisoners were waterboarded, suspended from ropes, beaten, and treated in ways that the U.S. has always considered criminal when it was done to our own soldiers. We would not have known that the Bush administration decided that the rules for foreign intelligence surveillance collection were too cumbersome, and that they should throw them aside and collect whatever they wanted under the president's own authority, leading to the near resignation of the attorney general and the FBI director. All of this was classified, not just classified. This stuff was classified at the highest level. These were the secrets that the government said were the most critical to conceal. If we only knew what the executive branch wanted us to know, as I said, and if an executive branch classification stamp defined the four corners of public knowledge, 
our democracy would be weaker, not stronger. So that's part one. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about the tools that the government uses in order to try to enforce its monopoly uh, on this information. Now ordinarily, as any of you who holds a clearance uh, ought to know, the criminal law is not required uh, because the loss of a security clearance is pretty devastating. You can lose your livelihood, you can lose your community, your ability to work in your profession, and that is enough to deter almost all lower level leakers. Uh, and of course, as we said, higher level leakers simply don't get prosecuted. Uh, or if they do, as in the case of General Petraeus, uh, they escape without real punishment. Uh, the Espionage Act of 1917, uh, and this is the law that sent Eugene Debs to prison for opposing World War I, um, broadly criminalizes the gathering, receipt, and dissemination uh, of what's called national defense information. Um, it's important to know um, uh, that this law, which essentially is so broadly written uh, that it doesn't even exempt the reporters who publish the information, although no reporter has been prosecuted in this country, uh, that for most of the history of the Espionage Act, it was used to target spies, not people who leak to the press, largely, I think, because of constitutional concerns on the part of government officials. Um, in 1979, and at this point, no one in the history of the United States had been convicted under the Espionage Act for giving an information to the press. The general counsel, the top lawyer of the CIA, testified to Congress that he could not even say for certain whether leaks to the press of classified information were prohibited by criminal law. He testified that if the Espionage Act makes it a crime to disclose defense secrets to the press without subversive intent, then in his words, we have had in this country for the last 60 years an absolutely unprecedented crime wave because surely there have been thousands upon thousands of unauthorized disclosures of classified information, all criminal acts in the view of the Justi Justice Department, and yet none has ever been prosecuted. Now the Supreme Court of the United States has still never considered uh, whether it's constitutional to use the Espionage Act to go over after people who provide national defense information to the press. But in the meantime, uh, all the lower courts that have considered this question have upheld the practice. Uh, and if you were to summarize the case law uh, as it stands right now, basically virtually any deliberate leak of classified information to an unauthorized recipient, which would include any reporter, uh, will fall within the reach of these statutes. Uh, the government can, can prosecute most, if not all, employees, ex-employees, contractors for these leaks, uh, so long as it can show that the information was not in the public domain and that the leaker knew or should have known that the law prohibited it. And as I said, by its plain terms, this would include journalists and publishers, um, but until recent investigations, uh, there's never been any real threat uh, that a journalist uh, would be prosecuted. Uh, the trend of the case law, uh, and uh, I, I don't want to be too legalistic here to speak in a non-lawyer audience, um, is that the executive branch's classification decisions define the boundary of the criminal law. Uh, what that means is that there's no defense of public interest. There's no ability for the person who leaked the information to say that this information was improperly classified and the government should have to show why it was properly classified. Uh, there's no ability for the leaker to say that the publication of this information led to changes in the law, um, led to legal cases in which courts held that the disclosed conduct was actually illegal or unconstitutional, led Congress to change the law. None of that is relevant whatsoever. The government doesn't even need to demonstrate that the leaks caused any harm. It's basically a strict liability offense. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the government has argued in recent court cases that leaks to the press are actually more dangerous to the country than the sale of secrets to foreign enemies. Because if we sell secrets to enemies, only one enemy gets it. But if we publish it in the newspaper, all enemies can read it. Uh, so this is the state of the law that a uh, someone who would consider leaking has to take into account uh, before undertaking that action. Uh, this was the state of the law when Edward Snowden decided to board a plane to Hong Kong uh, rather than to take his chances uh, in a U.S. courtroom. Um, so switching gears one more time, uh, what is it, in my view, that Snowden revealed or helped to reveal? Uh, if I had to use one sentence to describe it, I would say that surveillance technology has far outpaced uh, 
democratic controls. Now, among people who study surveillance and privacy, uh, there had been a growing concern over the previous decades that rapid developments in technology and the plunging costs of data storage uh, had made it, for the first time in human history, technologically and financially feasible for governments to collect and store virtually all human communications, movements, activities, and associations. Um, and this is a new development uh, and one that we need to think about as a society because it used to be that our rights and privacy, I think, were more protected by cost than by law. Uh, consider what the government would have needed to do 25 years ago if it wanted to know where I was over a five-day period. Uh, they very likely would have had to assign teams of agents to follow me in shifts around the clock. Uh, and the money that they would have to spend to do that would act as a constraint on whether they uh, were, were willing to do it. Uh, they'd have to have a pretty good reason to follow me if they wanted to spend the money and manpower uh, to follow me over time. Today, one officer sitting at a laptop can track thousands of people in real time for as long as necessary, uh, or call a phone company and get that information. Uh, because everybody, every one of us is carrying around a tracker in our pockets uh, at all times. Uh, and this creates, uh, I think, a, a very new situation uh, for the law. Now, we knew, of course, that these capabilities were being developed. Um, what Snowden showed us is that the government is already deploying these capabilities on a mass scale, uh, and that the motto of the NSA essentially was, let's collect it all, the authorities will follow. Uh, let's construct a surveillance time machine of all of this information that may be useful someday, uh, and when something occurs, we can hit rewind and, and set back the clock. And, and to facilitate this, the government had secret legal theories that were not disclosed to the public and not subjected to, to public debate, um, that they could collect as much information as they wanted with no constitutional constraints on that, and that the law only came into play when a human being went to query that database. Uh, so it didn't matter, they could collect, uh, by, this, by this reasoning, they could have collected the content of all of our phone calls and not just the metadata. They could put cameras in your house as long as they don't look at the footage uh, until they ask permission to do that. This is the legal theory. Um, I think that this is dangerous and represents a long-term threat to free societies. And here's one of the dangers of collecting all of this information. Uh, I think that the studies have shown that it's not terribly useful for stopping terrorism plots because there's not very much terrorism. And collecting mountains and mountains of information doesn't help you find very, very, very rare events. But it's extremely useful as a forensic tool. If you want to find out what happened yesterday or the day before or a year ago or five years ago, um, having the kind of databases that the NSA has will be enormously, enormously helpful. Uh, and that's why the trend is going to be that these databases are going to migrate from our intelligence agencies to our law enforcement agencies. Uh, and you already see some of this in the Snowden documents, where it's the FBI and the DEA and other law enforcement agencies that are getting into these NSA databases to use them for things that have nothing at all to do with terrorism or national security. Uh, and so the use of this technology will not be limited to terrorism. Uh, if you collect all of these dots, they're always going to connect in hindsight. So think about what will happen if there is another major terrorist attack in this country, uh, as there likely will be. We can be fairly sure that the information that might have prevented that attack will be sitting in one of our databases. And we can be pretty sure that the president, whether it's Donald Trump or someone else, uh, and national security officials will say, if only we hadn't had these rules prohibiting us from going into those databases, we could have stopped it. And we can be pretty sure that the policy change that will follow that uh, will be to tear down the restrictions on who has access to this information. This is exactly what happened after 9-11. Uh, and then very soon, uh, information that has been justified, the collection of which has been justified for terrorism purposes, uh, is going to be available to anybody in the government. We won't have to be targets uh, of government investigations in order to be affected by a world like this. And let me use General Petraeus as an example yet again. No one suspected General Petraeus of wrongdoing. Uh, one woman sent an anonymous email to another one. Uh, the second one was alarmed and brought that email to the FBI. And the next week, the FBI was pouring through thousands of General Petraeus' private emails, uh, which I think was a major violation of his rights. Now, some of you may say, this story has a happy ending. That's how they revealed that he had given classified information to someone who wasn't entitled to receive it. Uh, to me, it's an example of dangerous overreach and something that more of us can expect to see.
So Edward Snowden observed that this architecture that I'm discussing now had been constructed without public debate. He observed that the ordinary oversight structures, the Congress and the courts, had comprehensively failed to do their job. Uh, among his turning points were watching the Director of National Intelligence lie to the American people about what the NSA was doing so that the public could not consent to it, uh, and watching the Supreme Court throw out a challenge that would have asked the courts to say whether this conduct was legal or not. And he recognized that the only way to initiate a public debate that should have occurred before the deployment of a global mass surveillance regime was to somehow bring the public into this discussion. Uh, and this, of course, is the most controversial decision that he made. Um, he provided information to three journalists. Uh, the number of documents that he has published himself remains zero, although he surely could have published them all had he chosen to do so or given them to an organization like WikiLeaks. Now, his instruction to the reporters that he chose was that they were to correct for his own biases. I mean, he had spent his entire adult life in the intelligence community uh, and did not trust his own judgment uh, and wanted the journalists and their editors and their news institutions in consultation with the government to make decisions about what publication would serve the public interest and what ought to be withheld. Uh, and most has been withheld. Only a few hundred documents have been published um, in the last two years. Um, and no article from this archive has been published without consultation with the government and giving the government an opportunity uh, to make its case for why uh, information should be redacted um, or withheld. Um, so what have these revealed? Just to, re to, to go over this again, that contra James Clapper, bulk collection of American phone records, uh, uh, that the NSA was collecting metadata from every single phone call made in the United States, uh, one Republican federal judge referred to this program as Orwellian, uh, and a unanimous panel of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals held in 2015 uh, that the program was illegal and had never been authorized by Congress. Um, they revealed, uh, again, as I said, also the failure of uh, congressional oversight. They revealed that the NSA had violated privacy laws uh, thousands of times each year, exceeded their own authority. Uh, one of the early uh, articles was about an NSA report that showed that it had violated its own rules 3,600 times in one year, uh, and the chairman of the Senate intelligence community found out about that report by reading the Washington Post. It hadn't been provided to her. Uh, that the NSA was systematically undermining the basic encryption systems of the Internet, making it difficult or impossible for us to know if our sensitive banking or medical data is really private, uh, and damaging American businesses that relied on this trust. Um, I won't go through um, what I think are the rest of the really key disclosures, and I'm sure that most of the questions that you have will be about how the principles that I articulated apply to the particular Snowden case. Uh, what I do want to say in closing, though, uh, is that I think that, that all of us in this room uh, are engaged in different aspects of the same project. Um, I told some of the students this morning um, that I had the wonderful opportunity in January to co-teach a law school class with General David Bramlett, who was the commandant of this institution, I think from 1989 to 1992, uh, and is now retired. And we taught a one-week class called Liberty and Security in an Age of Terrorism that covered a lot of these issues and more. Uh, and General Bramlett, uh, who's an incredibly gracious person, uh, opened the class by saying to the students uh, that we were two individuals who had devoted our lives to defending the Constitution, uh, and that the only oath that he had ever taken was to the Constitution, not to the state. Uh, and I think this is really important for us to remember that you know, we are, all of us, here to defend the democracy that we've inherited. And we haven't inherited it the way that you might inherit money that you're allowed to spend. Um, we've inherited it in the way that you might inherit an estate that you have to maintain. Uh, this thing will not maintain itself. That in every generation, and look no further than this election, um, there are uh, what I think are real threats to our common values. Uh, and we have, all of us, uh, in some way chosen to devote part of our lives to defending those values um, rather than just seeking our own fortunes. So 
It's been a great pleasure for me to be able to share some thoughts with you, and I'm glad that we seem to have plenty of time now for some discussion. So I hope someone will ask a first question. Thank you. So we'll transition to Q&A, and please feel free to just uh, you know, raise your hand, we don't call on you, and, uh, and just keep in mind that this is a time when we can really parse out uh, what our biases are and, and, and try to understand the uh, foundational ideas and topics that really inform the, the, the briefs. Yes. Sir, could I jump in? Uh, earlier you stated that the government should not be able to decide whether or not something should be classified. So how would you like to see that decision be made? Would you like the Edward Snowden style where you have yeah. both the press and the government simultaneously going over it together? Or is there another avenue? Yeah, so that's slightly different from what I said. Um, obviously, the government will always be the classification authority. Um, the argument that I'm making is that the government's classification de decision can't be the end of our discussion about whether information should be secret or public. Um, because we know from human history and from the history of our own country that many, many classification decisions are made not to protect the public from genuine harm, but to protect officials from embarrassment or accountability. Um, massive amounts of information are improperly classified. So what's the solution to this problem? Um, here I'm not going to satisfy you. I don't actually think there's a solution to this problem. Um, I don't think the answer is that everyone who sits in your position or Edward Snowden's or Chelsea Manning's um, has a, an independent right to make those decisions in a way to be devoid of any consequences. Um, that, that's not a, 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 a system that could possibly make sense. The best that we've come up with in this country is that we have aggressive investigative reporters working for respected news organizations that are trying to pry information out of the government that the government is trying to keep secret, that it's a kind of contest between the fourth estate, um, uh, which is, of course, protected by the Constitution. It's in the First Amendment, freedom of the press, uh, and uh, government officials who always err on the side of too much secrecy. Um, and, and again, as I said before, it's not always the press um, you, you know, essentially prying secrets out of the government that the government doesn't want out. The government uses the press for that purpose as well. I think the drone program is a great example of that, where officially the CIA's involvement in the drone program is still clandestine. Uh, that means that it doesn't publicly exist. Uh, and if you, the, 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 but the CIA wants us to know that it's doing drone strikes. It wants us to know that it killed the number three person in ISIS. Uh, and so it calls up the, the press and uses it as that kind of outlet. So I think the, the answer in this country has always been uh, to make sure that the press is legally protected to be able to make those kinds of decisions. Now again, you may disagree with some decisions that the press made. Um, you may think that the press has published certain stories irresponsibly. Um, but I can't think of a, uh, I don't think there's an elegant solution um, to this problem. I think it's just a hard slog. Yes. How are you? Nice to see you again. Um, just, just as a, as a general, I just want to get your personal opinion about the subject matter. Uh, you know, you talked about, about uh, Bradley Ch Chelsea Manning or, um, or Edward Snowden. Um, how do you reconcile or rationalize the breach of trust that they had with the uh, United States government? With our nation's secrets, they decided to breach that trust. Yeah. And so, and, and, you know, and that trust is memorialized in a civil contract that, that many of you will be asked to sign with the government. It's a standard form. It's a classified non-disclosure agreement that essentially says that if you violate that agreement and, say, publish it in a book, the government will be able to go after your profits. They might be able to take other actions against you. Um, but again, we have to look at this from all sides. Um, what if you genuinely believe that the activities that you're observing violate the Constitution. Uh, and so you have the Constitution on one side, to which you've sworn an oath. You have the trust and the institution on the other, to which you've at least signed a contract and you know, owe some duty of loyalty. Um, now, most people in most circumstances are going to go with the institution. Uh, and for a lot of the reasons that we said, even if they're not worried about criminal prosecution, they're worried about losing their whole career. You have to have a pretty compelling reason 
to step from that out of it um, and to put yourself at risk and put your family at risk, possibly. And then the question is, how should you do that? So I think that for, for many kinds of um, activities that you uncover, the correct way to do that would be through existing channels. So if you are serving overseas and you see that there is comprehensive fraud and contracting, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars are being wasted, people are being bribed, that may not be a constitutional problem. Um, but there are channels that ought to exist um, for you to report that, if not up your chain of command, because maybe they're implicated, um, at least somehow to the Congress. But what if you're in Snowden's position? And the conduct that you've observed has fundamentally been deemed legal by the entire system. So that these are programs that have been authorized by the president on down. Um, the director of the NSA uh, you know, certainly approves of them because he's rolled them out. So there's no one in your chain of command uh, where uh, it, you, know, you can go and say that this is misconduct because the chain of command has said it's legal. Uh, that the court that oversees the intelligence community, the Secret Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, has approved the activities. They've been briefed to the Senate Intelligence and House Intelligence Committee, so that you know, the Congress is also aware of them. Uh, so the only people who are not aware of them are the American people. So then what do you do? So, so someone like Snowden can take a huge risk like he did. Um, in the weeks after his disclosure, President Obama said quite correctly that the activities that were revealed by Snowden had been approved by all three branches of government. Now, he was saying that to suggest that, therefore, we had nothing to worry about. I think it means the opposite. Because look what's happened since the public was brought into the conversation. All three branches of government reversed their position. Um, the president himself said that some of the programs went too far and unilaterally changed them after creating his own review panels that involved uh, foreign, uh, former intelligence officials. Uh, the Congress, for the first time since 1978, restricted rather than expanded the surveillance authority of the NSA and the intelligence community. Um, and open federal courts that could actually hear from both sides um, have rejected at least one of these programs as illegal. Um, there literally was no way to use existing systems to achieve those outcomes. Now, most people think that having courts actually decide whether a government program is legal or le illegal is a positive. That having in a debate in Congress that has full information and full public knowledge about it is a positive. So how do you reconcile this? That there are you know, what most of us would consider these positive impacts uh, from this. But nonetheless, you know, there is that breach of trust. I think the answer is that that's something that every individual who holds a security clearance will in some way have to decide for himself or herself. You know, what do you do and what's your limit? Um, but I would suggest that there is not a single person in this room who doesn't have a limit. There isn't a single person in this room who would not uh, find some way to go outside of the chain of command if necessary if they saw something, depending on what that thing was. Uh, I don't think anybody in this room would have been silenced if they had witnessed the Milai massacre and there was no way to deal with that within the chain of command. They would have found a way uh, to make sure that someone else knew about that. Um, so people have their dials in different places. Um, for you, it wouldn't have been surveillance. It would have been something else. Right? But, um, but I'm not, again, I'm not here to say that there's a right answer to this, but to say that it's a hard conflict. Yes. I think that I think that WikiLeaks presents a, a different case from the one that I'm talking about here. Um, you know, I, I think that the the most legitimate way to do what something like what Snowden did is to do it the way he did it, um, which is to put um, news organizations that you know are responsible to a certain set of core journalistic values between you and the public getting. Uh, and so every time you read a story in the Guardian or Washington Post or the New York Times or Der Spiegel from this archive, you know that an institution that takes journalism seriously has consulted with government officials and made a decision about what to publish and what not. Uh, interestingly, that is how WikiLeaks used to function. And so when they first got the Afghan war logs and the collateral murder video, 
Um, they didn't publish that stuff themselves. They went through the New York Times and the Guardian and Pierce Beagle. Uh, and so their, their views have evolved over time where they now will get um, you know, hundreds of thousands of pages of secret Saudi documents and then just put them on the internet. Um, and who knows what the source is for something like that. Uh, you can certainly be used by foreign intelligence agencies for, um, uh, for something like that. So that's certainly not what I would advocate. Um, legally, I think they stand in a similar position to other publishers. Um, it would be very hard if you were a prosecutor to come up with a way to prosecute WikiLeaks that wouldn't also challenge what Bob Woodward does, what the New York Times does. These guys aggressively try to pry secrets out of people and publish them. Um, and the fact that WikiLeaks is a foreign publisher kind of cuts both ways. Um, they may not, the way the New York Times does, um, have some broad public American interest at heart. But at the same time, if we start going after foreign publishers, what's going to happen to New York Times reporters in China? Um, you know, our, our American reporters are trying to pry secrets out of Moscow and Beijing all the time. Uh, and we wouldn't want to say that, uh, you know, create a precedent where those reporters could face domestic legal pressure in those regimes. So it's a hard question. I don't know if I answered it. I'm not going to say what I think of anybody personally. Yes? Last question, I promise. Um, you know, for uh, politics aside, sir, I just wanted to, again, just uh, get, get your feel on this uh, subject matter. Um, someone who is seeking the highest uh, office in our, in, our, in our nation here who uh, released classified information, um, what, where, do, where do you stand on, on that? Sorry, will you be a little bit more specific? <laughs> yeah, just, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be, I'm not going to let you take it over there. And uh, you know, we had classified information as the Secretary of State and now we are seeking the highest office in our nation. Um, but again, all going back down to that to that to that question. Uh, and having been able to 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 hold our nation's secrets, uh, if there is catastrophic uh, results if that information is being had. You know, I don't know what's in the specific emails that are in dispute right here. Um, I what this is evidence of more than anything else is just how much the intelligence community considers classified. If I had to guess, I would guess that somebody sent Secretary Clinton emails about the drone, drone program, and then she wrote back about the drone program. Uh, uh, right? So the, the emails that she wrote weren't stamp classified at the time. She was just writing about something that the whole country was talking about, but that the CIA still considers classified. So when they get that document to review it in the Freedom of Information Act case, they stamp it classified. That would be my guess, but I don't know. Um, I, I can tell you that um, if the FBI started examining the computers of the foreign policy elite in the United States, this would include senators, their staff, uh, members of the National Security Council, uh, you know, basically all the top foreign policy makers in, the, in, in Washington, if they went and examined all of their home computers, they would find something classified on almost all of them. I mean, it's just impossible to do your work without having classified documents around because of how much is classified. Uh, and, you know, of course, it's come out in the last few weeks that all of Secretary Clinton's predecessors were found in this investigation to have also had classified, you know, information sent from private email accounts. Right? Every Secretary of State has. So, so I think, you know, having said that, um, that doesn't mean that this can't be a useful national debate. Um, you know, I certainly think that government should take cybersecurity more seriously and that our top officials you know, ought not to have bespoke servers in their homes. Um, now, that's not to say that the government has done a great job protecting this either. The Office of Personnel Management, which holds all the records for security uh, and clearance investigations, every single one of those is in China right now, including mine and many of yours, right? And we've all gotten these notices from the government saying, you might have been involved in the OPM breach, right? Um, so no one's doing a great job here. Uh, so to the extent that, that, it, that it brings that to the public, but, but I don't, you know, my intuition is that uh, to the extent that there's smoke here, there's the kind of smoke that you would find if you trained um, a lot of focused criminal investigators on anybody who holds that kind of office. Doesn't mean there weren't errors in judgment. There was a question over here. Yes? Yes, sir. Uh, shortly after the discovery of the I had the opportunity to actually visit the NSA and talk to some people at various levels in that organization. Uh, and there was a very, what seemed to be a very sincere belief, you know, obviously it's kind of a biased source. 
belief that uh, a lot of the information that he had uh, released or had taken with him from the system was significantly damaging um, to the U.S. national security, particularly with regard to Russia and China. Now, I don't know the specifics of any of this, but I know that uh, this is not really related to prison and some of the other yeah. you know, programs like that. So is there a difference between leaking information about a specific program and leaking information in the Yeah, I think, I, I think the criticisms over scale and judgment are, are completely legitimate. Um, I, I, you know, again, the problem is that someone in my position can't argue a negative. Um, all of the statements that are made about harm to national security are completely broad and sound like all the others. Um, so they say, you know, have disclosed methods to terrorists and now terrorists are using encryption and not using cell phones. Never mind that, you know, Osama bin Laden stopped using a cell phone in 1997 after a drone strike, right? Or, or that we have, ter you know, terrorist encryption guides from long before Snowden. So th there's really no way for me to say no harm has come. What I can say is no persuasive public case with evidence has been made that the publication of any of these stories um, has caused harm. Uh, the government has had a lot of incentive and a lot of opportunity to make a much better case um, than it's made uh, about harm. You know, having said that, I think that there, there are other things in your question. I think um, a lot of people understand releasing information about a program that then is investigated in court and held to be illegal. Um, and they have a harder time understanding some of the broader disclosures about how the NSA was essentially you know, circumventing encryption, um, you know, breaking into the back doors of Google and Yahoo overseas to, to, to get at unencrypted data. I can tell you that those stories that, that the public has questioned the value of have been the most watched and most important and most valued story in Silicon Valley or places where technology companies are. So, and, and, and I think that, that a huge amount of the change that has occurred since Snowden has been those companies um, you know, patching up vulnerabilities that spy agencies were able to exploit. And by the way, it wasn't just ours. Right? There, there's, there's no such thing as a vulnerability or weakness that only the good guys get into. Uh, the bad guys do too. So um, you know, we could have a longer conversation where you say, do you think this story was legitimate? Do you think this story was legitimate? Do you think this story was legitimate? Um, I, the question that I ask when I, when I read every story is, um, is this something that the public generally ought to know, or is there a very good reason why I should not have known this before I read this story? Um, so it's not so much, does he get to maintain his label as whistleblower? It is, you know, should I be reading this or should I not be reading this? Um, I usually come out on the side of, this is something that I'm glad to know in a democracy that my government is doing this and has this capability. All right, that's about all we have time for. And thanks so much. Uh, Thank you all. About this really challenging uh, issue. I hope that uh, you guys will really take this and start to really think deeply about why you think the way you do about the things uh, related to secrecy, privacy, and security. So please join me again. Give them a warm uh, round of applause.